All right, good morning, everyone. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for our first webinar of 2024. It's very exciting. We're back into it. I think we've got a jam-packed month of webinars coming up at AI. So if you're not registered to any of the other ones, have a quick look what else is coming up. Uh, we'll do some housekeeping while participants trickle in. So if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, there's a Q&A function um, for you to utilize. So please pop your questions there. Um, we'll keep an eye out, um, but if you do put your questions in the Q&A, um, if we don't get time to answer them today, we will send around an FAQ afterwards. So um, the Q&A will help us track any of those questions we don't get to. Um, if you have any audio issues as well, um, you can communicate with our um, team through the chat. All right, let's do this. Before we begin, I did want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we all meet today, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. If this is your first AI webinar, welcome. And if it is your not your first, welcome back. Um, here at AI, we are really passionate about making employment easier in a very, very complex employment landscape. And we do that through um, our services, but also through education initiatives like our webinars and content like this one today. We deliver a variety of services from HR advice, HR partnering and strategic project support, payroll, employment law, all in that um, employment space. My name's Alana and I look after our HR Ops team here at EI. We're a national team and we deliver a product called HR Partner. We work really closely with businesses to implement HR initiatives that supports their operations and broader business objectives. I'm excited to be joined today by my colleague Jacinta. Jacinta, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm looking forward to going through the webinar. But um, yeah, as Alana said, my name's Jacinta and I'm a dedicated HR partner within the HR Ops team. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jacinta, for joining. In terms of our agenda for today, so today we'll be discussing collaboration and communication in the workplace with a particular lens on initiatives to help you if you are in a geographically diverse workplace. I know that some organisations may not be able to facilitate hybrid or remote working for all roles. And while we reference that a little bit today around sort of hybrid working, um, the learnings are probably better generalised as just ch uh, challenges facing geographically diverse uh, workplaces. That could include you know, a manufacturing organisation that has a portion of the workforce based out of a warehouse and then a portion based in an office um, or a company with multiple offices located all around Australia. Whether you're working from home or in a different office or in a different physical location, you should be considering all of the impacts that that can have on communication and collaboration. So with that context, we'll be discussing uh, first up what collaboration is and why it's important and why you should be really focusing on fostering that within your workplace. And we'll then go through some of the challenges that having differing work locations has presented when it comes to communication and collaboration. And then we'll finish up walking you through some recommended initiatives to help you overcome some of those challenges and help make sure your team all feel connected irrespective of where they are. All right, so why is this topic so important and why are we talking about it now? So the topic of communication and collaboration is always an important one, but it does deserve a closer lens when we're talking about a diverse geographically diverse workplace. A number of reports were released throughout 2023, 2023, 2023, um, and they indicated that there is a growing shift towards a return in office, even in part compared to previous years. And that means that we'll have more situations where companies, whole teams, parts of teams uh, will be split between being in office and being remote, which presents its own unique challenges. Ari released a report on hybrid and flexible working practices, and I've put 
these on the slides. So if you Google them, you should be able to find them pretty easily. Um, but the RE report showed that organisations who are shifting to a minimum of three to five days in office, which is quite a lot, has increased to 48% from the 2022 number of 37%. So there is a greater shift towards mandating more time in office. Based on this, we are looking at having more and more situations where you're going to have majority of your workforce in office, but the likelihood that some people will still be remote. One person in office, everyone at home, one person at home, everyone in the office, irrespective of that dynamic, where you're not all in the same location, you should be considering practices to put in place. The RE report also highlighted that there were three top disadvantages that they identified of flexible working, where employees do start to feel disconnected from their colleagues, which is very topical and a big driver for our webinar today. They also identified a reduction in staff collaboration, and they also identified difficulties monitoring performance. In this same report, however, it presents a number of case studies that illustrate how organisations who provide flexible hybrid working arrangements are now seeing this as part, a pivotal part of their benefits and their employee value proposition, their EVP. So that's all the further reinforced by some other research showing an increase in flexible working arrangements being um, advertised in job ads. So um, again, reinforcing that that's being seen as an employee perk. So flexible working presents a number of communication challenges, but it's necessary to remain competitive with attracting top talent. It really sounds like quite the conundrum. And it's really uh, an issue that's not simply solved, but with some thought and planning and you know, implementing some strong initiatives, you can find quite a good balance. So I am going to hand over to Jacinta to kick us off um, by walking us through collaboration more broadly as a concept and why it is something that you should be seeing as um, an important driving factor in your organisation. Okay, thanks, Solana. So in the rapidly changing landscape of technological advancements and ongoing globalisation, effective collaboration among individuals is crucial for the successful completion of day-to-day -day tasks and operations. And as such, organisational li literature frequently emphasises the importance of collaboration within the workplace. Although workplace collaboration is wide a widely discussed topic, it's often misunderstood. So while organisations recognise its significance and attempt to implement it, this doesn't always translate to optimised results. A common practice tends to involve dividing work tasks among group members, leading each individual to focus solely on their assigned tasks rather than working collectively towards mutual results and generating innovative ideas. This approach can confine individuals to their comfort zones, hindering the exploration of peer expertise and the realisation that collaborative input could resolve problems more efficiently. So despite the acknowledged importance of teamwork, successful results require appropriate execution and ongoing support. So what is exactly workplace collaboration and how can the successful foundations add value to your business? So essentially, it's where individuals work together to achieve a common goal. So leveraging on diverse skills, knowledge and perspectives. In today's work environment, collaboration has emerged as a crucial element for organisational success fostering innovation, problem solving, um, engagement and productivity. The process involves individuals or groups working together, synergizing the expertise, ideas and resources to achieve a shared objective. Uh, it involves open communication, mutual respect and a collective effort towards the common goal. Collaborative environments often encourage collaboration through brainstorming, idea sharing, uh, joint decision making to capture the collective intelligence of the team. So research conducted over the years has consistently shown the benefits of workplace collaboration, specifically finding that the mere awareness of teamwork for a common goal not only positively impacts the organisational performance, but individual performance as well. So however, 
as we briefly touched on, the sex successful result cannot always be guaranteed. So how do we best approach collaboration? With clear objectives and a goal established, understanding individuals' values and experience within the workplace becomes essential. It provides insight into employees' attitudes, skills, and motivations, ultimately shaping their perceptions of the workplace. So a lot of this will come down to culture as well. So group values impact collective efforts in a team setup. And a successful group requires a mix of individuals with diverse skill sets to effectively tackle tasks and achieve goals. So one foundation of successful collaboration, once it's established, uh, several benefits will start to emerge. At EI, uh, we particularly aim to see four main results within our clients. So um, often we will have clients that are forever changing their landscape, um, wanting to go to a hybrid model or even reducing their hybrid model given um, the impacts of COVID are reducing. So um, we'll usually work with them through a flow of changes and then um, hopefully be able to measure some results from that. So one is enhanced creativity and innovation. So one of the primary benefits of collaboration is its ability to foster creativity and drive innovation within organisations. When individuals from diverse backgrounds and skill sets come together, they bring unique perspectives and ideas to the table. This diversity of thought often sparks creativity, leading to the generation of innovative solutions and approaches that might not have emerged in a siloed working environment. So collaborative teams tend to explore unconventional avenues, challenge existing norms, and produce new ideas that drive organizational growth. So secondly, we tend to see an increased problem-solving capabilities amongst the team. So collaboration essentially empowers a team to tackle complex problems more effectively. By pulling groups together, diverse viewpoints and expertise, teams can approach challenges from multiple angles, leading to comprehensive problem analysis and innovative solutions. Furthermore, collaborative environments promote a culture of continuous learning where individuals learn from each other's experiences and skill sets. So it enables them to problem solve more efficiently and adapt to evolving situations. The third benefit we aim to see is an increased engagement. So effective collaboration fosters a sense of belonging, involvement across among team members. Um, so when employees feel valued for their contrib contributions and are actively involved in decision-making processes, their engagement levels soar. Collaborative environments encourage open communication, active participation, and a sense of ownership, leading to that higher job satisfaction and deeper commitment to achieving collective goals, as well as organisational goals. More so, uh, the collaborative culture nurtures a supportive and inclusive atmosphere where individuals feel motivated to share their ideas and opinions without the fear of judgment. So here we have, um, I guess, further enhancing that engagement across the team which is going to always be a benefit when wanting a collaborative workplace. And lastly, but not least, um, we have enhanced productivity, which I'm sure is something that we all love to see. So collaborative collaboration significantly impacts uh, productivity by streamlining workflows and optim optimizing processes. Uh, when teams efficiently collaborate, tasks are allocated based on individual strengths. So leading to improved task efficiency and time management. Moreover, shared knowledge and expertise among team members facilitate quicker problem resolutions and decision making, reducing delays and bottlenecks in project timelines. Uh, collaborative tools and platforms also play a vital role in enhancing productivity by enabling the seamless communication collaboration among geographically dispersed teams, which is something we will touch on shortly. But essentially, um, with enhanced productivity through in collaboration, uh, we're going to be able to use tools to enhance that and make sure that there's that connectedness across the team, which um, we definitely will go through some initiatives later on. Um, Alana, given your experience with hybrid models, what do you think is the most prominent uh, initiative or outcome? Yes, it's a good question and it's hard to pick one of all benefits, but I do think that a lot 
naturally flows from the first point you mentioned around our creativity and giving people the freedom to think creatively and, you know, creating an environment where people can be encouraged to innovate. I think that type of team and working environment means that people are going to naturally start to think outside the box when they're solving problems and they'll start to come up with ideas that you may not have considered even at a management level, but also ideas that might go against the norm and sort of um, further fuel um, other idea creation. For the right employee as well, having the freedom to uh, have some control over their role and tasks and the autonomy to provide ideas and improve the way they work. It can be really motivating and um, boost those latter benefits that you said, Jacinta, around engagement and productivity. Um, a lot of employees are really driven by the ability to innovate and be creative in their day-to-day -day work. So I think they're all intertwined, but I do think they naturally stem from creating an environment where employees are able to innovate, where they can brainstorm and there's freedom to share ideas and they can be a little bit creative. So that's yeah, they're my thoughts. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So now that you're on board and a collaborative workplace sounds great, how do we move forward? So transitioning from a traditional organizational structure to a team oriented setup can be a significant adjustment for leaders and employees alike. Um, historically, organizations and managers were content with a single person defining operations and distributing tasks. However, we now understand that teamwork significantly enhances overall results. So task delivery, realization and individuals' mental well-being compared to working in isolation. Um, and I think that's something, again, that we definitely would have uh, realized through the, the COVID years, um, which is where we've had to adapt and, and really look at team collaboration to keep that mental health up. So the saying, there is no I in team, fittingly illustrates the importance of workplace collaboration. Uh, effective leaders in organisations, much like coaches in sports teams, uh, comprehend the significance of maintaining team balance and assigning individuals to positions where they can have the most impact. Uh, so therefore, if we start by understanding each individual's strengths and weaknesses and values, leaders can develop precise plans for each employee and we can utilize their abilities more efficiently. So simultaneously, leaders must emphasize the value of teamwork and mutual support and team interconnection to create that buy-in. So I think um, we really understand that the golden, golden rule in this case is that effective collaboration in the workplace balances out individuals' abilities and skills so within the organization's overall needs as well. So this will result in a successful setup for the entire enterprise. So really just looking at um, not just placing individuals into a team by a random select, but actually looking at where people are going to add the most value to that team um, and being able to draw on each other's weaknesses and strengths essentially. So we will further discuss initiatives that focus on building, boosting connectedness, especially tailored to hybrid working environments. But first, Alana will touch on some of the challenges faced when it comes to effective communication and collaboration. Yes, thanks, Jacinta. So we've reflected on what collaboration means and how valuable it is. But before we move on to some of the challenges that you might be facing, it's worth us quickly walking through the different working models that have grown in popularity post pandemic. This isn't anything life changing, but yeah, important context before we move on. Um, a lot of organizations are still in positions where they're transitioning between models and finding the one that works best for them, whether that's you know more time in office, less time. So I'll quickly recap the three most common models, um, all of which present their own pros and cons. So on one end of the spectrum, we've got remote working, which is where your primary workplace is your home or a remote environment. In these situations, some workplaces may have like an optional shared uh, working space, but the standard practice is that your whole work location is remote. 
A remote workforce can mean that there's no physical interaction uh, possible, even if desired, um, given uh, many employees may be geographically diverse or there might be geographical barriers. Um, if you aren't hiring in the same location and you're hiring in all parts of Australia, even if your team would like to go to a same working uh, location, it may not actually be possible. So um, there is that added constraint. Hybrid working is obviously a bit of, bit of both, it sits in the middle, um, and it's a flexible model that combines your remote and your on-site work, allows your employees to split their time working from home, working from your traditional model. Some businesses might mandate particular days of the week um, that uh, employees are required in the office, or they may let their employees choose the days that they would like to come into the office and try and maintain some flexibility. Um, either way, hybrid work workforces and workplaces can struggle to try and ensure that everyone feels connected and included, particularly when there are team members that are physically connected, but also the same team, like team members in the same team that are remote. So it can be that tricky balance of making sure people feel um, connected and included, even though they're not together. Um, in office is obviously the other end of the spectrum, as it indicates, uh, businesses in this uh, operating model will want their team back in office full time. And it may actually not be a choice. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the in office or, um, you know, sort of the traditional way of working may be dictated by the role. Um, given the earlier research, research that I mentioned, businesses mandating the in office where there's an option to be providing remote work may struggle to find and retain key, key talent. Um, flexibility and remote working is really becoming a perk and a key part of um, organisational EVPs. So um, it is something that businesses really need to uh, weigh up when considering uh, a shift to completely in office. All right, so a lot of what we'll be discussing today are initiatives that you can look at implementing in a completely in-office environment. Um, but we do know that where we're in different locations, communication and collaboration is really challenged. And that's um, yeah, usually in that geographically diverse workplace. So we will be um, shining a particular light on those challenges. Um, when we discuss these challenges, there are two main prongs. So challenges in communication, challenges in collaboration, but they do overlap a little bit. Um, with In terms of communication challenges, um, physical distance and time zones is obviously a really big communication roadblock. International time zones are a factor, but even within Australia, time zones can come into play from the West Coast to the East Coast. You're potentially looking at you know, a three hour time difference. Time zones can complicate that real time communication and it can make it more challenging to coordinate meetings or um, attain, obtain immediate responses if there is a need for a quick response. Um, it can also slow down decision making um, and it can create a sense of isolation among team members who aren't able to quickly communicate um, or easily communicate with their other team members, particularly in instances where they do need a quick answer, um, but, you know, parts of their team are offline due to their time zone. Uh, technology, while it is our friend, can sometimes hinder communication in remote environments, by now I'd say probably a guarantee that we've all been impacted by technology letting us down. Um, there's nothing worse than the internet dropping out or Zoom freezing at a particularly important part of a meeting or mid-webinar. Um, inconsistent internet, uh, glitches with tech, um, even not being able to access particular tools, so accessibility issues, passwords not working, outdated tools, um, all of these issues can really impede communication while they can help. They can cause more delays and can really result in a lot of frustration. So um, technology in many ways 
uh, is our friend, but can also um, facilitate communication issues. A lack of face-to-face -face interactions naturally presents its own communication challenges as well. The absence of a physical presence reduces things like nonverbal cues, um, and it does make it a lot harder to interpret nuances and emotions, particularly when having difficult conversations. Um, as well, informal, spontaneous chats and discussions that would naturally occur in an office environment or in a face-to-face -face environment are needing to be replaced by scheduled meetings, um, and that can really hinder the fluidity of conversation, particularly the end of a meeting, you will just drop off a meeting. Whereas, you know, if you are in the office, you might end your meeting, but then you chit chat as you walk back to your desks or you sit in the room for a little bit afterwards, um, you know, catching up socially. So there is definitely, uh, yeah, something that's missing there when you are trying to um, communicate just through virtual meetings. In terms of collaboration challenges, team alignment, is definitely a challenge that we see in a geographically diverse workplace. The physical separation of team members can present challenges with making sure that your team are aligned on their key objectives and the direction of the company, whether it's uh, divergent schedules, um, a time delay in communication or um, a reduction in uh, those spontaneous conversations. So a lot of the issues I've mentioned before, these can all impact team cohesion and a team's understanding of their priorities. And that in turn can obviously hinder progress and all of that stuff. Inconsistent information as well is a bit of an issue, particularly um, information that's given to those face-to-face -face versus what's relayed remotely. That can be really impactful. Um, you know, particularly where you are having those ad hoc uh, conversations to those that are next to you in the office and not necessarily making a concerted effort to re-communicate that to those online. Um, that's really something that can hinder um, team alignment, but it's all about trying to maintain that unified vision and direction. Um, and that can be a real challenge when you're not all together. For similar reasons, knowledge sharing is no longer as natural as it would be if we were all together in the same environment. Your casual conversations, sharing tidbits, um, you know, water cooler chats or, you know, those conversations you would normally have when you're making a tea in the kitchen, they all cease completely. Um, it really does hinder those uh, organic conversations, those idea sharing situations. In an environment where you have team members partly together, partly virtual, it does uh, present challenges in consistency and making sure that consistent knowledge is being shared. So similar to what I mentioned before, you know, are you making sure that you're disseminating the same information to your remote team as you are having casual face-to-face -face co uh, conversations with those sitting next to you? Uh, culture changes, very broad topic, but uh, culture encompasses things like your values, uh, team norms, and your expected behaviours. All of these will naturally shift when you're not together in a physical working environment. The autonomy that comes with hybrid working or working remotely can naturally start to dilute particular behaviours that um, are becoming the norm um, and that's commonly established due to the uniformity of being together as a group for an extended period of time, like 40 hours a week, spending time physically together with the same people. It can start to build um, particular behaviours and norms. It isn't always a bad thing to break those norms, but um, if there is a particular attribute or behaviour that you're really wanting to maintain or encourage, effort needs to be made to create mechanisms for your team to continue to display those behaviours um, and also ways for you to reinforce um, those positive behaviours when they occur. The one thing I wanted to quickly touch on before we discuss some initiatives um, is around your manager's mindset 
towards remote working and flexibility. Managers do need to undergo a shift to fully embrace the different way of working and all of the strategies that we will talk about today will be really difficult to implement successfully if we don't try to combat that reluctance. Um, it's key that there is a transition from a time-centric mindset through to an outcome-oriented approach, really trying to prioritise results, outcomes, rather than the notion of time spent in an office. And that in itself involves a whole bunch of trust building um, within teams and a really big reliance on clear communication and mechanisms to hold team members accountable, as opposed to having just physical supervision, you know, being able to see that someone's at their desk doing work. I will touch on it right at the end of the webinar, um, just to go through a few um, of the things you might want to prioritise if you are looking at trying to make this a permanent shift. So I've just rattled off what seems like issue after issue um, about working remotely and flexibility, um, but you probably won't find a bigger advocate for flexibility where it's possible than myself and the team here at AI. It just takes a really concerted effort to make it work well and the implementation of specific initiatives to really fill in the gaps that we've just spoken about. So it does lead us naturally into our next section, which is about um, some of those initiatives that you can tangibly implement to try and fill in some of these gaps that are um, potentially hindering communication and collaboration. So over to Jacinta to kick us off. Yeah, perfect. So as Alana said, we're going to move through some of the initiatives that boost connectedness across the team um, in a hybrid model, um, but also definitely can still be utilised in an in-office setup. So first we have technology. So the reliance on technology for connectedness is a natural progression in response to the evolving dynamics of our workplace. Uh, virtual communications have transcended traditional barriers, allowing teams to bridge geographical distances and engage in real-time communication. So whether through video conferencing, instant messaging, or collaborative platform, technology essentially serves as the key for meaningful connections, enabling team members to stay in sync and work cohesively irrespective of physical locations. In this, virtual meetings are a great tool for maintaining interpersonal relationships with teams. Leveraging meeting platforms such as Zoom or Teams facilitate those face-to-face -face interactions, which foster a sense of presence and connection even in the virtual realm. Familiar features like video conferencing, screen sharing, and real-time collaboration create an immersive meeting experience that transcends the limitation of physical separation, similar to how we are today. Uh, we recommend establishing best practice for virtual meetings. So first and foremost, opt for interactive virtual meeting platforms that offer engaging features. So we want to be able to jump in similar to Zoom, have a question box, raise your hand um, and get involved in the conversation. Uh, we want to structure agendas in advance and ensure discussions stay focused and contrib contributors are well uh, prepared. And then we have encouraged active participation from all team members. So like I said, util utilizing features like chat boxes, virtual hands and involving participants in the conversation. And then probably one of the most important and that is provide technical, technical support to address issues promptly. Um, a seamless virtual experience contributes significantly to connectedness. So like Alana touched on, there's nothing more frustrating or flustering um, than technological issues, especially when um, you have an important meeting or webinar, and I'm sure we've all been there at some point. So this is definitely a key contender um, when looking at connectedness and technology in the team. Additionally, uh, there is the integration of project management tools, which further amplifies the role of technology in promoting connectedness. So these platforms serve as a centralized hub for communication, 
ensuring that vital updates, discussions and project related information are easily accessible to all team members. So combining virtual meetings with a project management tool not only enhances productivity by streamlining workflows and projects um, and timelines and such, but also ensures continual touch points and communication between meetings. So we tend to see a motivated team with a shared sense of purpose and accountability as a result. So generally, um, we always emphasize that during your team meetings, your virtual catch-ups, that you're utilizing your project management tool to jot down different tasks and responsibilities, and then we're able to add dependencies to those um, and ensuring that the team are just continuing to have touch points throughout a project timeline in between those meetings and not having to, I guess, take up um, and block out calendars full of meetings all the time. Um, so project management tool really comes in to play in successful connectedness and I guess um, in productivity across the business. And Alana is going to take us through some culture initiatives. So I'll pass that to you. Yes, thank you. So again, I've kept culture as quite a broad category, um, but that really includes ways that you can maintain your, I guess, uh, the, the assets that uh, make your company what it is you know, ways that you meet, ways you celebrate wins and really ways that you can make sure your uh, team feel connected and recognised. So the first uh, initiative would be around recognition program programs. Well-developed uh, recognition programs in a remote environment can really help you combat some of the uh, emotional connection issues that a hybrid environment can present. That sense of connection is really created by acknowledging and appreciating an employee's contribution despite where they're located um, and where they're working. In the absence of constant face-to-face -face interactions and, you know, those off-the-cuff uh, feedback mechanisms, recognition programs can help you bridge some of those communication challenges and gaps um, by creating an environment that really recognises achievements and in turn starts to enhance motivation and uh, keep your employees engaged. Recognition programs that are really closely linked to your company culture, your values, those guiding behaviours that you expect of your team are a great way for you to combat the earlier mentioned uh, difficulties in saturating your culture, um, positively reinforce, reinforcing the behaviours that you want your team to display will encourage them to be repeated um, and it will start to sort of perpetuate an environment that prioritises achievement. Uh, people want to strive to try and get recognised and get that good feeling um, and it really starts to encourage people to think outside the box, innovate and collaborate to try and get that recognition as well. Uh, Recognising not only individual achievements, but team accomplishments can really help in strengthening team cohesion as well and encouraging collaboration, trying to make sure that you're creating that sense of unity um, across your team, irrespective of where they're working. Um, so that's really important as well that you're taking um, an approach to not only individual, but also team recognition. We could dedicate a whole webinar to creating a well-developed recognition program but I'll rattle off a couple of the key characteristics that you should be considering if you are um, implementing a program for the first time or you're thinking of revamping yours. The first uh, tip is to make sure that uh, your recognition is being delivered in a timely manner. So you really want to be making sure that you're reinforcing behaviours really soon after the effort occurs. You want to be connecting effort versus reward. Um, so timeliness of recognition is really important. You also want to make sure that you are being quite transparent and consistent. So making sure that your uh, recognition criteria is really clear. So the team know what they need to do to be meeting the standard, um, but also make sure that you're adhering to that recognition irrespective of the employee and where they're working. So you want to make sure you're applying those practices consistently and you are still recognising behaviours that are potentially not being seen by your eyes, um, you know, making sure that you're putting in mechanisms to measure and recognise um, those standards irrespective of where they are. 
Um, make sure you consider using multiple channels for recognition as well. Everyone has a different preference for recognition mechanism. So just make sure that it is multi-pronged. So some people love public recognition, private recognition, but make sure it is personalized. And if you include a variety of different ways to um, communicate where performance has uh, met a particular standard or is a standout, um, you can try to tick all those boxes. So make sure you're including it in virtual meetings and public platforms and things. And also ensure, as I said before, really close alignment to your values and your behaviours as well. And that's really so that you're creating an environment where you're always pushing your team to excel and display the behaviours that are going to push you and your company in the right direction, if that is teamwork, if that's customer service related, you know, if that's a really big part of your business and something that you need to be driving to meet your goals or to be successful, then you really need to be rewarding the specific behaviors that are going to ensure your team are working towards um, those goals. Um, ultimately, a well-developed recognition program is more than just bonuses and monetary rewards you should really be considering all of the ways that you can make sure that your employees are feeling seen and valued um, when they do meet a particular standard. All right, in terms of team events, there was an Atlassian report that was released recently. It was quite lengthy, um, but they did talk a little bit about their change to the work structure um, and they did reiterate the message that face-to-face -face time is important. It just is not necessary every day. And I completely agree. I think there is a time and a place for face-to-face -face interactions and team events. Um, there are a number of organizations now that are using the money that they are potentially saving on downsizing their office space um, by having a remote team environment to really invest in more well thought out team interactions, but on a less frequent basis, making sure that the face-to-face -face interactions when they occur are really meaningful, that their purpose is really intentional and that they're more elaborate. Um, many of these organisations that we work with are trying to make these interactions be seen as an employee perk. So, you know, flying the team in for, a, for some time together, and really trying to make the effort to make it special. You can also save these face-to-face -face sessions um, for sessions that benefit from the joys of face-to-face -face workshopping, like strategy days, planning days, even like process workshops and things. Um, so you may want to do them more frequently, less frequently, depending on their purpose. Um, but saving those events for where they'll be most effective also makes them a little bit more special when the team are together. Um, but can make them more effective. It's really about making sure that they're targeted and considered rather than just mandating time to sit next to each other in an office is getting the team together to spend time in the office, the best use of their time. And um, can we make that a more special occasion? To complement a lower frequency of face-to-face -face interactions, virtual social events play a critical part in um, filling those gaps and really nurturing your culture on a more frequent basis. A well thought out virtual events schedule calendar can really create some mechanisms for your team to feel connected and like they belong. Um, it'll create interactions for incidental conversation and uh, more social interactions. And those are the things that we really miss almost immediately when we're working remotely. So these are really important to complement your face-to-face um, -face interactions. You could consider in this schedule some more elaborate formal virtual activities um, like virtual escape rooms, facilitated team building workshops. There are a lot of amazing virtual team building activities that have been created um, yeah, that are yeah quite elaborate and can be um, quite inclusive for um, a geographically split team. They're really great if you are wanting to celebrate something. You know, you've 
hit your goals for a quarter or whatever that might be and you want to put on something fun and social for your team to reward them, those bigger um, sort of more formal virtual events are a great way for you to weave, the, um, weave those in. Um, it may also um, mean that instead of engaging a third party to facilitate events, you might want to encourage your internal team to host events, um, things like talent shows, virtual trivia, cooking, recipe sharing, that kind of thing. They can all be really easily done virtually and they can also be really easily hosted by your internal team. And that in itself can give the hosts a sense of purpose, mix up their day-to-day -day, um, and really, you know, feel uh, engaged by planning and facilitating something that's for their broader team that might be company or team-wide. Um, it also can be a bit more approachable financially if you're not in a position to be, you know, uh, engaging a third party, um, giving your team the opportunity to step up and facilitate a team-wide event um, is a good alternative. These more elaborate planned um, events can be intertwined with a bunch of informal initiatives as well. So try and think about ways that you can uh, replicate some of the interactions that you're missing from not being in the office. So think of things like uh, virtual cuppa, virtual coffee breaks, virtual happy hour, um, even virtual lunch and learns are a great way for you to bring a group together to share knowledge like you would if you, you know, were eating lunch in the kitchen together. Um, so making sure that you're trying to replicate those incidental conversations. It does take a concerted effort and a bit of a group, a, a group of happy participants to get it off the ground and build momentum. But they are a really great forum to break up the day and really try and encourage those less formal communication mechanisms as well. So over to our next set of initiatives, I should say, um, around communication protocols. So Jacinta, did you want to walk us through these ones? Yeah, perfect. I think that smoothly takes us into communication protocol. Uh, which provide a consistent and robust framework for conveying information across teams and departments. Um, and as such, they help reduce ambiguity by establishing clear expectations for how, when and where information should be communicated. Um, defining expectations for communication channels and methods ensures that information flows seamlessly and consistently. So ultimately, Leadership should emphasise these protocols, uh, setting the tone for effective communication from the top down. And when employees witness and experience leadership actively embracing and promoting these values, it sets the tone for a communicative culture throughout the organisation, irrespective of an on-site or hybrid setup. So centralised communication platforms act as the very core mechanism to facilitate conversation and collaborative efforts. Um, whether through project management tools, which we touched on, intranet systems or dedicated communication apps, these platforms ensure information flows seamlessly. It's um, important to recognise that asynchronous communication is crucial when implementing communi communication protocols and systems um, and should be given consideration. Platforms like email, messaging apps particularly, and collaborative documents like Google Sheets, Google Docs, um, should enable employees to communicate at their own pace. This uh, flexibility, this is going to provide flexibility and it accommodates different work schedules, promoting that inclusivity and ensuring that all team members have that equal opportunity to participate. So something um, that Alana touched on was having teams across all of Australia um, definitely asynchronous communication is going to help um, with that time gap, whether it's um, national, even just, uh, you know, Queensland and New South Wales, there's that small time gap um, during daylight savings that we need to accommodate for. So, yeah, this um, brings us into knowledge sharing, which essentially is our currency for growth. Encouraging employees to document insights, solutions, and best practices into communication channels culminates with a lower frequency of face-to-face -face interactions, 
and improve collective knowledge and understanding overall. Um, additionally, this can be expanded into team collaboration meetings, so where discussions encompass workflows, updates, upcoming changes, and informal knowledge sharing. So distributing updates and responsibility across the team during these meetings will definitely enable you to fuel responsibility and encourage that open communication and active participation. And this is overall um, going to give a sense of ownership amongst individuals within the team. So one thing that we probably pull from communication apps and channels especially is creating dedicated channels. Um, there might be more of an informal conversation that takes place, whether it's about at home, pets, family, things going on in life. Um, it creates that face-to-face -face interaction that would happen in the office, similar to what Alana was talking about with tea time. Um, but it also allows for continual updates on projects. You might pop into different channels when different teams are working together. Um, that can be done both in a communication app or a project management tool. So overall, our journey towards enhanced connectivity hinges on a holistic approach to communication by seamlessly integrating centralised platforms, communication from leadership, knowledge sharing mechanisms and group participation. Um, taking into consideration that asynchronous communication as well. We're not only fostering a collaborative and in interconnected workplace, but um, we're definitely getting that high-performing organisation that generates growth and success as well, So which takes us back to that connectedness and collaboration. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jacinta. And I'll wrap us up talking a little bit about work structure. And I was trying to figure out a way to weave this in um on topic but I just think it's relevant to a lot of what we've spoken about um just on what Jacinta was saying you know you do need to be making sure that all of this is led from the top um you know if you are a manager that has a team that's with you face to face you are responsible for making sure that you're then re-communicating the same message back to your remote team so just make sure that you are um you know putting those protocols in place and making sure you're adhering to them yourself if you are part of that management team. So in a similar train of thought to close us off today, all of the initiatives we've spoken about are a great way for us to combat communication issues and collaboration issues, um, irrespective of whether you're 100% in office or 100% remote. All of these challenges are um, a constant battle, but they're just exasperated a little bit where you're not together physically. Um, the initiatives we've spoken about are really going to be aided by a rethink of how you might measure productivity. And that's what I want to leave you with um, as we close out. The third challenge that was identified in the RE report that I spoke a little bit earlier, um, it was all about the challenge in monitoring performance. Um, so if you are still in a position where you're quantifying or defining, product, defining productivity based on face-to-face -face time um, or time spent in an office, then a lot of the initiatives we've spoken about are going to be really tough to implement. Um, a shift towards being outcome-driven rather than input-driven has been something that many managers have needed to embrace um, given a lot of people didn't have their team sitting next to them during the pandemic. But we have seen a shift back to a bit more of a traditional way of managing work now that we are going back into the office. The shift towards outcomes is all about defining what success looks like. So really clearly articulating what that is and how it's measured and how you're going to measure your team on achieving their objectives. Your team will, in turn, actually start to think about ways that they can be more impactful with their uh, initiatives and their contributions, rather than just focusing on putting more time into their work. It's more about uh, putting more effort into what they're contributing. Um, emphasizing productivity based on what's produced and what's achieved rather than that activity gives your team members greater autonomy and really starts to encourage collaboration and um, efficiency and innovation. In saying that, though, managers may actually not feel comfortable 
managing their team in that particular way. So you may look at um, upskilling initiatives and, and ways that you can encourage your managers to move out of that traditional manager role into that more mentor, coach, high level position. It's a really different way to, you know, that traditional management approach. Um, we're also seeing a new generation moving through the ranks and creating or being a larger portion of the workforce. And that newer generation is really all about autonomy and they don't love and receive micromanagement very well. So they really want flexibility. And so it's going to become more and more of a um, priority. To get to this point, though, where you are um, looking at uh, outcomes rather than inputs, you do really need to work on making sure that you have clearly articulated roles and responsibilities and mechanisms to measure um, those outcomes. A real barrier to productivity is a lack of clearly defined processes and efficient processes and also a lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities. And funnily enough, they don't magically change when you walk into an office. So they are universal things that need to be prioritised, even if you are back in office face to face. Um, operating in this way where you're really changing your priority um, can reduce some of the challenges that come from a communication and collaboration perspective. If you are, as a manager or your team themselves, really clear on how you are measuring towards an outcome or how your team are measuring towards an outcome, it really reduces that need to have regular check-ins and always be communicating and always checking what your team are doing, removes that need for micromanaging. You can really at a high level um, see how your team are tracking. Um, so it's a really, um, I guess, a, a, another way for you to move towards reducing some of those collaboration um, and communication barriers as well. So that is my parting message to leave you all with today. Um, so we'll wrap it up there. We are almost bang on 12. There were a couple of questions that came through, so we'll put an FAQ out um, to avoid going over. Um, to send you on your way, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We always love to have new faces and returning faces on a webinar. We hope that you got something out of it, and as always, we're really excited by this type of content and helping our clients in this space. So please do reach out if you need any support in implementing anything that we've spoken about today or further clarity. And thank you, Jacinta, for jumping on with me. It was so nice to hear all of your valuable expertise. So thank you for sharing. No worries. Thanks for joining everyone.